teaching. Well, welcome everyone to our church. If you're here, well, if you're online, we yes. just welcome you and just pray that you'll have a, a blessed time while you join us in the service this morning. Yeah. And I'd like you to all to stand and we'll sing, we'll say the worship that the
that your presence is here. We cut off every diabolical assignment and rebuke it in your name, Jesus. In your name. Thank you that you have given us that authority to trample on every attack. Oh, thank you, Father God. Oh, your presence is so obvious. And I thank you, Father, that you're moving in this place. And even across this Wi-Fi, you're moving and touching people, even in their homes, right yes. now as they listen on. Yes, thank you, and thank you that you have given our beautiful pastor a new word for today. And as he comes forward, we believe that you are speaking through him. Jesus. So we ask, Lord God, that you bring your word into our hearts and move in us in a new and special way. Thank you, Father, for all that's in this day. Thank you for all my brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship you, Father. Hallelujah. And now we get to worship and just enter in. Enter in. See what yes. God has for you today. Jesus. Hallelujah.
my God.
when we give you all our glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We exalt you. Receive our worship and our praise today, O oh God. Let it be a sweet sound to your ears. Let it be even as the evening sacrifice, a sweet smelling aroma to you, O oh God. We exalt you and give you praise. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you so much. You may be seated for a moment. We were singing about light and darkness. When you're out on the farm like we are, we out there, it can be very, very dark. You put me in the field, and my husband says, well, just go out that gate. But where is it? I can't see it. It's too dark. And then, even with the headlights on, that's like us looking out. I still don't know where to go. So then I look for a light. Yeah. And I follow the light. That's like us looking to God and following Him in our darkest days. Just remember that little story. It's just, oh, seeing the light. Okay. We welcome everyone here and those of you watching. We just pray that you are blessed. And right now, I would like to take to have the offering and ask Brother Ryan if he would come and pray for the offering.
took our place on Calvary's cross, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. We sing of your amazing grace that loves us so much. You gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in you should never perish, but should have an eternal, eternal life. We bless you today, God, and we give you all the glory. Amen. God bless you. You may see you. Well, now we get to hear what God has laid on Pastor Ray's heart to give us today. So let's welcome Pastor Ray. God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved you the world that he gave us his son. We are grateful for the opportunity to be in his house as we gather together to worship and praise his holy name. We know that because of the time we're in, we're asking people if they're experiencing certain symptoms and whatever, to maybe just kindly stay home. So with all that being said, it is a given that from time to time we won't have much of our members as people are just taking an extra precaution, cautionary step just to keep the body safe and healthy and we just want to bless you and greet you, those of you who are watching from home. We serve a great and awesome God. Amen? Amen. We just want to thank you for uh, joining us in worship today. And our visitors, we just want to say thank you. And uh, may the Lord do something marvelous in your heart today. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You know, we're just, uh, it's unfortunate the times in which we're living, but the Bible did prophesy these times. And uh, I watch the news and I see what's going on and um, we're seeing the best in some people, we're seeing the worst of some people and um, you watch as uh, President Trump was diagnosed with coronavirus and there are so many haters out there that they hate the guy so much that they're actually wishing he would die. Um, it's sad when people can put politics aside and just desire the best of our fellow man. But there is a biblical principle actually that I believe based on this principle God may revive him more than what his haters are anticipating and he may in fact win the re-election. Re Who knows? But in Proverbs 24 and in Proverbs 24, verse 17, this is not my sermon, but I just had to, to touch on it. Proverbs 24, verse 17, it says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Lest the Lord see it, and it displeases him, and he turn away his wrath from him. That's a warning for everybody. It's not just a matter of in politics, but that's a warning for everybody. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Do not let your heart rejoice when he stumbles. Because God will look at it. And it will grieve him and he will turn away. And if it was God that was actually doing the punishment, God will have mercy on him. And he will in fact be revived. I want to minister to you today the word of the Lord. Taken from Jeremiah chapter 32. If 
I can find Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 32. Hallelujah. I'm hoping to do an exhortation today. Which means I'm hoping not to be as long. But I leave as always that to the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah chapter 32. Verse 27. Very short simple words. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I'm going to read it again. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day that you have given unto us. I thank you for the opportunity that we have that we can gather freely in this place to worship you, to bless you, and to be blessed by you. Now, Father, as you have placed this word on my heart, I submit myself to you right now. And I pray and ask that you would speak forth your word through me as you would have it delivered. Let me say nothing more and nothing less than what you would have me to speak today. Let this word go forth and accomplish what you please and prosper in the thing for which you sent it. I give you all the praise, all the glory, and the honor. And the saints of God say, Amen. Amen. I do not come before you this morning with some elaborate sermon, something new. But in fact, I come to you with a simple reminder. Because oftentimes, we need to be reminded. And so this is the Lord himself asking a question. Before he asked the question, he established himself that he is the Lord. That he is the God of all flesh. He is suffering. And then he goes on. Is there anything too hard for me? I took the time to look up some definition of a few very simple words. Nothing big, just a very simple word. And one of the words that I looked up was think. Is there anything too hard for me? And so that word thing, it's davar in the Hebrew. And the noun essentially means word or matter or thing. Some of the major meanings are, now I want you to pay attention to these because I believe you will be able to find your life situation in one of these words. Some of the meanings are words, saying, speech, news. There should be a comma there, but it's news. And then command, promise. Thing. Here we have it again. Incident. Occurrence. History. Concern. Cause. Question. And lawsuit. I don't know where you are at in your life, but I am confident that you will find your life situation somewhere in one of these words. Is it a news that you have got, gotten, received? It's 
So the Lord would say, is there any news too difficult for me that he cannot take care of? Has there been an incident in your life? A lawsuit? Wow. History. You know, sometimes we have some bad history. And sometimes the feeling that our history is catching up on us, so to speak. And God is saying, is there any history too hard for me that I can't be with? What about promise? A promise that maybe someone has made or even that God himself has made. A speech. You know, someone spoke some negative things into your life. You will never be so and so. You will never arrive. You will never overcome. And so, I, well, Lord, is there anything too hard for me? I took the time to look up thing. I wanted to see what the Lord is talking about. I know when we look at the scripture, we would just assume it just means anything. And, and, and actually it does. But it's great when we get into the Hebrew and, and get into some definitions and see what God is actually talking about. Question. Got a question too big and no answer? Why? Why, God, why? Like Job. Remember Job? Asking God all the questions. Why was I born? Why, God? Is there any question too hard or too difficult for me to answer? Occurrence. Has there been a recent occurrence in your life? That has just thrown you off. This word, thing, davar, actually comes from another Hebrew word, davar. It's the same word, but it has some, one of them has some stuff over the A, and the other one doesn't have some stuff over the A. I don't know what that means. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. But chances are they mean something similar and yet different at the same time. It is one of the most generally used words in the Old Testament. It is one of the basic words for say and speak. Mental or oral communication is the main idea. I want you to keep that in mind. Mental or oral communication. Sometimes we have many questions. We have many concerns. We have many doubts. And we don't necessarily speak them out. You hear what I'm saying? But they are inside of us. They are what is concerning us. Remember the Bible says Jesus knows, God knows what we have need of even before we ask him. So it's that mental communication. It's like you're reasoning with yourself or maybe you're reasoning with God in your spirit, but you're not saying anything. Could he be even like Hannah when she went and she was praying and Eli saw her, her mouth was moving, but no words was uttered. And Eli maybe thought she was drunk. Woman, what's up with you? It's so early. Why are you like, to no, my Lord. Anguish of spirit. Maybe she's lost for words. Maybe she can't just utter her words, but at least her mouth is moving. But it goes even deeper when maybe your mouth is not even moving, but deep down you have questions. You have questions. And I want you to hold on to that. I'm going to just touch on one other definition real quick. In our text, it says, is there anything too hard? So I looked up the word hard. And the word hard is pala. To be separate, distinguished, to be extraordinary, be wonderful, miraculous, astonishing, to act miraculous, 
The basic meaning is to be wonderful and to cause a wonderful thing to happen. So God is saying, is there anything that I cannot cause something wonderful to happen out of it? And in my mind, when God says, is there anything too hard? You know, sometimes you might be able to lift certain weight. It's real easy, almost effortless. And then somebody might say to you, can you do that? Can you lift that? And like, mm, I don't know, you might be able to do it, but it's going to be really hard. It's going to be really hard. So it can be done, but it's going to be hard. But what God is saying, nothing is hard for him to do. Are you getting what I'm saying? You can do certain things, and then someone might say, oh, that's okay, that I can do that. Ah, piece of cake. But then something else might be, whoa, man, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if I can do that. That's going to be really hard. I'll give it a try. And you do it. But it's very hard. You have to muster every ounce of energy and courage and whatever in you to be able to do it. God is saying it's never like that with him. And does it not make sense that it's never like that with God? Remember, in the beginning, God said. What did God do in creation? God spoke. So he is saying, nothing, it's not, yeah, I know I can do it. And maybe you know I can do it, but maybe you think it's a little bit hard for me. God said, nothing is too hard for me to do. And that's why the psalmist says, I will lift up my eyes, Psalm 121, from whence cometh my help. He says, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and of earth. In other words, what he's saying, the God that I serve, who's so big and great and awesome, to be able to create this universe, then there is nothing in my life that he cannot do. There is no problem that he cannot fix. Is there anything too hard for me to do? I want you to go with me to the book of Genesis. It's where this the first time this question was asked. Genesis chapter 18, we're going to read Genesis 18. I want to read from verse 1 just for context sake of Genesis chapter 18. Then the Lord appeared to him, Abraham, by the terebinth tree of Mamar, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the ground, and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. Then they said, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said, quickly. Make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, gave it to a young man, and he hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. Now, this ain't fast food. <laughs> this is not fast food. I mean, they're going to slaughter a cow and everything 
and clean it up and cook it. This is not driving through the fast food. This is not, or going to a restaurant and sitting down and, and in 10 minutes your food is out. I'm thinking these guys were maybe waiting at least maybe two hours longer. It may take an hour to cook the food. You still have to kill the animal and prep it and do all those things. So these guys were just chilling out. They were in no rush. Hmm. Then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old. Somebody say old. Yes. Well advanced in age. And Sarah had passed. Somebody say passed. Past the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Remember I said the word, the Hebrew word that was taken from another Hebrew word? It meant mental or oral communication. So here we have Sarah not saying anything out loud, but deep inside, she's laughing. She's ridiculing the message or the promise that she will have a son. The Bible said she laughed within herself. If you look at her, you couldn't tell she was laughing. But she laughed within herself. And sometimes, many times, when you look at the saints, one another, you can't tell that they're laughing. You may not be able to tell that they're even crying. That they have a lot of questions. Well, that's the definition. That's part of the definition that we read earlier. She says, I am old and I am past the age of having a child. Verse 13, And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child? Since I am old, and here we have our text again. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh. For she was afraid, and he said, no, but you did laugh. The title of my exhortation is Focus. Focus. And though we have heard many sermons preached on subjects like these, every now and then we need a reminder. You know what? Because every now and then we lose focus. God had made them a promise that they were going to have a son. And when God made them the promise, they were young, prime in age, maybe. Well, not prime. Abraham was 75, but back then that was prime. God made them a promise. They didn't ask God for a son. God initiated and said, you are going to have a son. Remember the definition? Is there anything? 
one of the definition, one of the words is promise. Is any promise. So as we look at that definition and all the different words, you could use one of those words synonymous with things. Promise, incident, occurrence, lawsuit. Whatever it is that you're actually going through, you could actually put that word right there. Is there any promise too hard for God to do? Focus! Focus! Sarah's focus was on herself. Sarah's focus was on their ability and or inability. So sometimes really it's not just about focus, but focus on Jesus, focus on God. Because at times it is very easy for us to focus on the wrong thing. And we exert the energy that is meant to be exerted on the promise, on faith, and everything that is good and positive. We use that same energy to focus on the negative. It's like fear and faith. Peter, when G Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. The Bible says, Peter's eyes were stayed on Jesus. Focus. But then the Bible said, the sound and the boisterous waves he took his eyes off Jesus and then he started to focus on the waves. And as soon as he did that, he began to sink. Now the Lord is reminding me and wants to remind us that in every situation, there will always be an alternative to focus on. But it's as if the Lord is saying, recalibrate your focus. Because as long as you look to yourself, as long as you look to the natural, you will see, you will in fact see all the impossibilities. You know, God said to me this morning, my people see impossibilities more than they see possibilities. And I thought about it. I thought about it. I thought about what God said. Because when we come across a situation, an incident, an occurrence, a promise, or whatever, and we will see we get to a certain stage and we say, oh man, no, this can't work anymore. It is very easy to see the impossibility that surrounds a situation. God says we fail to see what can be possible. And that is why, that is because we lose focus. We focus on the thing. We focus on the problem. Now, this is very easy to do. And that's why the Lord is reminding me today and he's reminding you not to fall into what is natural, but to live into the supernatural. Because it is very easy to be weighed down with what you see. I mentioned this not too long, that one of the greatest enemies of faith is sight. One of the greatest enemies of faith, or obstacles of faith, is sight. Because we can see. The story of the 12 spies, 10 of them saw giants. No, no, no. It wasn't 10 of them that saw giants. All 12 of them saw giants. 10 of them focused on giants. The difference? They all saw the same thing. 
And this, my brothers and sisters, could be a matter of make or break in our lives, in seeing victory, in seeing miracle, in seeing God coming through for us. Because they all saw the same thing. But 10 of them focus on giants. And 10 of them focus on themselves. We saw giants and we were like grasshoppers in their sight. Let me tell you something. God was never in the picture. Joshua and Caleb, they saw giants. They knew themselves what they were capable of doing. But they focused on the God who made the promise. It wasn't up to them to really make it happen. It was up to God because God made the promise. And so Caleb and Joshua, their focus was on God. God is able to give us the land. They are our bread and butter. The challenge facing us because we will always see giants. The challenge that is before us is to somehow allow faith and trust in God to arise and not focus on what is so easy to focus on. My brothers and sisters, let me remind you. It is very, very easy to focus on what you see. It is very, very easy to focus on what you hear. Especially if you get a bad news from the doctor. It's so hard to squish it up. And say to yourself, I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on my God who is greater, who is stronger. Focus. Sarah laughed within herself. And she had a conversation within herself. And she asked question in herself. She says, after I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Remember, is there anything, one of the synonymous words, again, is question. Question. She was asking, she not only laughed, but she asked a question. After I have grown old, shall I indeed? God is saying, is there any question? In Sarah's case, is anything too hard for the Lord? We could remove that word and put question. Because at this point in her life, she has questions. How can it be? I'm so old. I'm past the age. And so, is it possible? So for her, it was a matter of question. And so the Lord could have said to her directly, Is there any question you have that I cannot answer? Because she had question. She had question. I want you to turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, we're going into the New Testament revelation of what took place, of what really went down. Romans chapter 4, reading from verse 13, add some context to this. Romans 4 verse 13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, 
but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is void and the promise made of no effect. He, he was pretty much saying, if you're going to benefit from this, and if the only way to benefit from this is being a genealogy, um, being related to Jews through genealogy, then you and I don't stand a chance. If you have to, to be connected to the Jewish race through genealogy, then you don't stand a chance. Because the law, verse 15, brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Verse 16, therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead. And call those things which do not exist as though they did. Who, contrary to hope, in hope, believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall your descendants be. The Bible says, contrary to hope. Contrary to hope. Now, that is not easy to do. That is not easy to do. Because all you can see is the negative. All you can see, it's just right there. It's standing in your way. Contrary to hope, in hope, he still believed. It's almost like a ridiculous kind of faith. It's like a crazy kind of faith. It's an abnormal kind of faith. It does not go with the flow. It goes against the grain. You are believing contrary to what you see. It's like believing. You see, it's easy to believe it's going to rain when you see cloud in the sky. You see what I'm saying? You see something that in your finite knowledge, you can make some assumptions and certain calculations that based on this, based on history, based on my experience and evaporation and all that kind of stuff, I need to see clouds before it rains. But can you believe in rain without seeing any cloud? That is hard to do. It is hard to do. But the faith that God has called us to walk and to live is not the faith that declares rain only when we see clouds. Because that is not faith. And we will lose our focus. If we can only say it's going to rain when we see the cloud, then we will lose our focus. Verse 19. And not being weak, in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. Now we have Abraham and we have Sarah. And the two of them, based on the scripture, they're not on the same page. Sarah is, she's pretty much given up. I'm too old for this. She's looking at her own body, ability and inability, she wrote herself off. Not putting God in the equation. How many times, God would say, have we approached things and we do not even put God in the equation? But the Bible says Abraham did not consider his own body already dead. What? No, that's believing it's going to rain when I look 
in the sky and there is not even a cloud in the sky. That's what Abraham did. Now, back then they did not have Viagra. Abraham must have believed God was going to be his Viagra. I don't know, but the Bible says he did not consider his own body. You see, we can look at certain situations and we look at our abilities. And what God has called us to do, our ability is never sufficient to accomplish it. So Abraham did not look internally. Abraham, see, Sarah wrote herself off. So did Abraham, but in a different way. He did not consider his own body. He was not looking at himself. He was looking to God. You see where his focus was? Focus. Focus. That's what God is saying to us this morning. Focus. Focus. Who made Abraham the promise? Abraham did not make himself a promise, right? Did he? It was God that made the promise. So do you think there was a time in Abraham's life where he was like, come on God, hurry up. You made me a promise and I'm getting old. I'm getting old God, I'm getting old. I'm getting old. His focus was never on himself. Contrary to hope in hope belief. I don't know, and, I, and pardon me if I'm being too explicit here in the message, but, but you have to read in between the lines to see what is going on. His own body dead. Was that saying he could not have an erection? I don't know, but the guy was dead. But he did not look at himself. His focus was on God. Is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything too hard for me? If we look at ourselves, we will always be discouraged. We will be downtrodden because we will see God calling us to take on a mountain and a mountain is so much bigger than us. But then we start looking at what we can do. We start looking at our experience and all our qualifications and all those different things. And we don't focus on God. We have, we have heard these words so many times. His body already dead. Since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver. See, focus. Sometimes it's not because we're not focusing. We focus, but then after a while, we lose focus. The Bible said he did not waver at the promise. My sister, can you put up that definition for us again, for faith? He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. He did not waver. Faith, promise, see right there? Faith, promise. God made Abraham a promise. And so now because you are no longer able to make it happen, does that mean it cannot happen? And then if that's the case, it was all about you. Where is God? Who is the focus? Abraham's focus was not on himself. And what God is saying to many of us is our focus, our focus is off. And that's why we're struggling the way we are struggling. 
That's why we don't have any hope. That's why we don't live with anticipation. We don't live with anticipation anymore because we, we've lost focus. Because if you're still believing like Abraham, oh my, it takes a special kind of faith to believe God that you're still going to have a child when you can't even do nothing. When you're past the age, it takes a certain kind of faith to believe when you look around you and you use all your intellect and your reason and your ability to put things together and there is no way you can see how it's going to work out. It takes a special kind of faith to still believe that it will happen. But that's where God wants us to be. Is there anything too hard, miraculous, astonishing, wondrous for God to do? Is there anything too hard for Him to do? The question is not towards you, so to speak. Is there anything too hard for you to do? Is God asking, is there anything too hard for me to do? Is God asking a question? Is God asking a question? He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced. Woo! Being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Oh, that's worth underlining, that's worth highlighting. Being fully convinced. See, focus. Focus. Focus this morning, my brother. Focus this morning, my sister. Being fully convinced, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Wow. Woo! Fully convinced. What he had promised. He was able. See now, we need to get to the place where we start saying, God, I don't know how. I don't know when. But it's really not for me to figure it out. I just know you are able and you will do it. It's like Job. Say, for I know that my Redeemer lives. All the days of my heart service, I will wait until my change come. That's focus. For I know that my Redeemer lives. That's focus. You see, there are times when man, you look at himself and, you know, he's just discouraged at his state but he comes back around he comes back around to his faith and to his confidence in God and it's like he had to shake himself come on Joe come on Joe I know you're going through some stuff right now but come on Joe God is bigger than this I know that my redeemer lives and I'm going to wait until my change come focus because if we don't have the right focus this morning, if we don't have the right focus this morning, we're going to be like the chaff of the wind that the wind drives away. We sing the song, On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. When you look at this world, it might seem as if the world is falling apart. God says, focus. Coronavirus and politics and God says, focus. God says, focus.
focus. And if you want to help um, uh, undergird your focus this morning, read the Bible. Read Revelation. It will remind you of who is in control. And God says, focus. Don't let the storms and the waves distract you to take your eyes off Jesus. God says, focus. I don't have to ignore. I know the storm is there, but God says, focus. He says, focus. Here it says, he did not consider his own body. The word consider in the Greek, it means to observe. To contemplate, to reason. He did not observe. Wow. <laughs> he did not observe his body. You know what that would have just done to him? It would have discouraged him. He did not observe his... When God says you're going to have a son and you're past the age of everything functioning and you go out starting to examine yourself, what do you think that's going to do? It'll just make you more discouraged. Because you will see in whatever all the stuff that's not working. But the Bible says Abraham did not consider his own body. You know if I see a job that I like, that I think will be cool for me, I never let the qualifications discourage me from applying for it. I could care less if they say you need a university degree in this and that, whatever. If I see the job and I think if I like it, I'm still applying for it. I'm tired of looking at my own qualifications. I'm tired of looking at what I can do and what I can't do. I'll apply for it because if God wants me to get that job, somebody say favor. Yes. Something will show up in my resume that attracts me to them. Oh, this guy doesn't have a qualification, but you know what? We can train him. We can teach him on the job. He says, focus. Take your eyes off yourself. Take your eyes off the words. Off the saying, some people have said some stuff about you. Maybe you've said some stuff about you. Take your eyes off the speech. Take your eyes off the news. Take your eyes off the command. Take your eyes. Take your eyes off even the, the promise. Take your eyes off the thing. Take your eyes off the incident. Take your eyes off the occurrence. The question. The cause. The concern. The history. The lawsuit. Focus on Jesus. The reason why I said to take your eye off the promise because even though it's a good promise, you will look at the promise and then you will look at yourself and you will give up. The promise is great. But Abraham did not focus just on the promise. He said, he, verse 20 of Romans 4, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. Being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. So Abraham placed God above the promise. I don't care how good the promise is. Remember last week? I shared about the promised land. And Moses says, if your presence does not go with us, we don't want to go. I know you're promising us a land flowing with milk and honey. And all we're going to live in houses that we did not build. We're going to drink of vineyards that we did not plant. Oh, it's going to be glorious. That's the promise that God made. But Moses says, I don't want the promise if I can't have you. So never elevate the promise 
above the God who made the promise. Because you will actually look to the promise and you will see problem. <laughs> there is a promise and there will never be a promise without problem. But there will be provision. Three Ps. A promise. There will be problems. But God will make provision. Amen, somebody. Amen. But if you only look at the promise, you will just see problems. And you will not see the God who is greater and bigger that my God can still provide in the midst of this problem in order that his promise will be fulfilled. You see, Abraham, or Moses rather, Moses never thought God was able to bring, to provide meat in the wilderness. Oh, how we limit God. Oh, how we limit God because we're not able, we don't get our focus off ourselves. We don't get our focus beyond our situation. And it's hard to do. I don't want to make it sound like it's easy this morning. That's why the reminder of the word of the Lord to us this morning. Focus. Because it is so easy to look at the impossibility and to lose focus. God says, focus on me. If you got to turn off the news, turn it off. Get in his word. Be reminded. Regain your focus this morning. Because in the midst of a violent and crooked and corrupt and perverse world and generation, with everything that is going on, you will find peace knowing that God is in control and all things are happening according to his word and to his plan. But if you don't, you will find yourself like the rest of the world, running around in fear and in con Bob says, men's heart failing them for fear of things that are coming up on the earth. What is that talking about? People are dying. People will die. Heart attack. Living in such fear of what is happening. That ought not to be the child of God. Men's heart failing them for fear of things that are coming. God already told you what's coming. Focus. Focus. And I share this last portion of scripture to close. Luke chapter 1. You go to Sister Mary. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse, verse 23. There's a lot of history there. You know the story, but I just want to bring out a few points to you real quick. Luke chapter 1, verse 23. So it was as soon as the days of his service were completed that he departed to his own house, speaking of Zechariah. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me, to take away my reproach among people. Verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women? Why? Every Jewish girl would have liked to be the chosen one to bring forth the Messiah. But you have been chosen. You have been favored. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. 
and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Promise sounds great. Amen. But then comes reality. Then Mary, verse 34, said to the angel, again, here comes the questions now. See, God knows that the questions are coming. Is there any question you are? Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I do not know a man. We approach God with all the natural stuff because that's all we know. We approach God with all the natural stuff because that's all we know. We know from experience that a man and a woman need to connect in some way, shape, or form to bring forth a baby. Now through technology, they have special stuff, there's sperm banks and whatever, but a man still has to be involved. A man's sperm still has to be involved. They didn't have that technology back then. So Mary asked uh, a legit question. The question is legit. It's not like God is afraid of your questions. He knows they're gonna come. How can this be? Since I do not know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, Nothing will be impossible. Now I want you to keep something in mind, which is very hard to keep in mind. The Bible says your God and my God is able to do far more. Somebody say far more. Far more. Yes, yes. Far more abundantly, exceedingly, above all that you can ever ask or imagine. When you think about that for a moment, because your finite mind and my finite mind can only think of certain things. A matter of fact, history and experience limits our imagination. It's very hard to think out of the box. And Mary was doing very, that, the very same thing. She was thinking based on experience. How can this? She could not think out of the box. Far more abundantly, she could not think in a million years how it could be possible to have a child in her womb without a man being involved. But what is God saying? God is saying to you and I, leave the miraculous to him, but focus on him. Does that make sense? Leave the miraculous to him, but focus on him. In other words, you in your limited mind and imagination will not be able to comprehend Think of a way out. Think of a possibility. Think of a, how this is going to change. So because you cannot think of it, should you not believe it's possible? No, no. You still trust God. You believe God. It's not for you to figure out how God is going to turn this thing around. If you have a family issue going on from generation and your family is just fighting like crazy. How is God going to bring this family together? It's not for you to try to figure it out. God can make it happen. Just leave all the fine prints to God, but just focus on him and say, God, I don't know how you're going to do this. 
because I can't even think of a way how you can. But I know that you are able to do it. Because your word tells me you can do far more abundantly, exceedingly, above all, above all I can ever ask or imagine of you. Now you've got to like Mary. You've got to love her response. For God says, for with God, the angels are for with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, I love this. Behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. When the, when the angel says, the power of the Most High will come upon you and overshadow you, do you think she knew what that meant? I mean, I can maybe look it up. We know the Holy Spirit did not have intercourse with her. God forbid. And there's none of that kind of stuff. But when God would work a miracle in someone's life, for example, someone has a tumor and all of a sudden it's gone. It's a miracle, right? Something that was in there is no longer there. So don't you think God can do the reverse? Something that was not there is all of a sudden there. That God could place himself supernaturally in Mary's womb. But she didn't know what it meant, but yet she says, be it unto me according to your word. It's not for me to figure this out. I just know God is able and that God can do it and he can make it happen. So did Mary focus on herself after that? No. How can this be since I do not know a man? She did not focus on herself. It's time to start focusing on God. It's time to start focusing on his word. It's time to start focusing on his promises. I don't care what impossibility we are facing and we are, we are seeing. We need to go beyond that. The Bible says... Let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season we will reap if we faint not. People don't only give up because things are going bad and they're tired. Sometimes people give up when things are going well. They grow weary in well-doing. Elijah, after just having the greatest triumph of his life on Mount Carmel was then praying that God was taking his life. He was ready to give up. To surrender. Because he lost focus. Because he lost focus. Behold, I am the God of all flesh, Jeremiah. 3227. Is there anything too hard for the Lord to do? Is it a health issue? Is it a financial issue? Is it a relational issue? Bondage issue? Stronghold? Whatever it is, God is asking you the question. Is there anything too hard for him to do? I know there are giants. There will always be giants. There will always be giants. There will always be the three Ps. If you stick it out with God. When he makes you a promise, there's a devil that wants to throw up God's plans for your life. Hence comes the problem. But do you believe God enough that even though a problem seems so surmountable, that he will still fulfill the promise? 
that you can possess your possession. That he will make provision for you. Because sometimes it's not a promise. We embrace the promise. We sing, we dance, we shout. Because we can see where it all is possible. But what happens? What happens when you are now past the age of having children? What happens now when you look and you realize that this is now beyond my ability to make it happen? What happens when the person that was in authority was the head of the company and you thought you had connection to make your way up? What happens when that person quits and they move on? Does there come a place, a point, when you stop believing because what you're looking forward to is no longer the same? Like Lazarus, you believe God can bring about change as long as the guy is alive. But if the situation gets so bad that he's now dead, then so too is your faith. You just cannot find it in you to focus and to still believe God. God, you are more than able. Lord, I know you are speaking to me this morning. And I know you are speaking to your people. Someone, God, needs to grab a hold of this word. word more than ever before. They have heard it preached many times, but now is the season, God, where they need to regain focus on you like never before. Because there is a possession to possess. But they are seeing giants. And they are seeing themselves as grasshoppers. But oh, that you are calling them today to see the God of their salvation. The God who sits on the throne, high above all principalities and powers. You are calling them, God, to set their eyes on you. Not to focus on the giants, not to focus on themselves. Because you are greater than any giant there is. You are stronger than any giant there is. And we serve a God who is able, who is more than able to do far more abundantly, exceedingly, above all we can ever ask or imagine of him. So God, where our faith, some of us have buried our faith. But God, I pray today in Jesus' name, we will go back and God, we will exhume, we will dig up our faith. We will dust it off and say, come on, hope in God again. Believe in God again. Trust in God again. Focus in God again. He's able to bring me through. He's able to bring me out. He's able to bring me over. Help us today, God. In the midst of what is going on around us, to focus on you. If there is never a story in the Bible that teaches us to focus on you, it is the story of Peter walking on the water. And I pray God today from that story we will learn life principles. Oh God, so we will stay afloat. So we will stay afloat. Father, I pray for your people today. That those that are here, those that are watching online, God Almighty, some of us are sinking. Some of us are sinking, oh God. And it's because we have taken our eyes off you. But you are a gracious God. Seven times the righteous they fall, but the Lord upholds them. God, pull us out of the pit. Pull us out of troubled waters and cause us to stand on solid ground and regain our focus on you. This is
is my prayer today, God, as you have placed your word in my heart. I thank you and I give you praise for what you are going to do through this word. Your word will not return to you void, but it shall accomplish what you please. And it will prosper in the thing for which you sent it. Hallelujah, for you are a great God. You are a great God. You are a great God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And they that come to him must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. You know in your own lives, whether, whether it's a question, or it's an occurrence, or it's an incident, or it's history, or it's a command, whatever thing it is, whatever thing it is, be reminded today that nothing is too hard for the Lord to do. Trust Him. Focus on Him. And He will bring you through. To God be the glory, great things He has done. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this day. Go with your people as we go from this place. Bless us and cause us to be a blessing. Let your mighty hand be upon us, O oh God. Commission your angels to keep charge round about us as we give you glory. In Jesus' precious and holy name, God's people say, Amen. The Lord bless you. Have a wonderful afternoon. Shalom, shalom. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.